Hi guys, Dr. Gillard here. It is week five. It's Monday. It's spring of 2021. And we're starting adrenal insufficiency. So we'll start talking about both primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency today. And yep, off we go. Adrenal insufficiency, right? This is the this is the thing. Did Kennedy have adrenal insufficiency? Some say yes, some say no, because he did have an awful tan face all the time, which is characteristic of primary adrenal insufficiency. So we'll see. Usually it's more blotchy, though. I'll show you kind of a run-of-the-mill patient with it here in a little while. So what is it, adrenal insufficiency, uh, also known as hypoadrenalism? Um, it's basically the adrenal gland, for whatever reason, isn't working, and it's not cranking out its adrenal steroids. Uh, like, well, we know the adrenal steroids, the mineral, the mineral corticoids, the glucocorticoids, and the adrenal androgens. Those are the three types of adrenal steroids. And so primary has a little different look uh, than secondary, as we will see. Um, and it is dangerous. It's life-threatening because you need cortisol, in particular, to stay alive. Uh, and mineral corticoids as well. Mineral corticoids, of course, that's aldosterone, right? So it can be potentially life-threatening. You could go into something called an uh, Addisonian crisis, which we'll look at in the next lecture. Um, so, yeah, typically no adrenal steroids equals hypovolemia, hypotension, you could go into hypovolemic shock, hypo, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia. You could go into hyp, hypoglycemic shock, and you can die uh, with this condition quite quickly if it's severe. Uh, flashback, what is hypovolemic shock again? Remember, that's a shock where you've lost too much blood fluid, basically. And uh, without blood fluid, like the serum and all the water, the, just the fluid that's in your blood. You need that fluid to keep the pressure high. Without pressure, you can't pump the blood around and you, the tissue becomes hypo-perfused. Um, so, if, and then if you don't get oxygen to your brain and liver and spleen, you'll die from that. Um, this loss of volume, what causes the loss of this blood fluid? Could be just from de simple dehydration. Not simple, but have to be severe dehydration. Uh, something wrong with the kidney where it's not reabsorbing water. We looked at uh, we looked at diabetes insipidus. Last lecture was it, or lecture before that? Uh, or maybe it's hemorrhage. You're just leaking the blood fluid out from uh, internal hemorrhage or external hemorrhage. Uh, bottom line, you're going to have shock because without blood pressure, you can't perfuse the organs. What's the prevalence in general of adrenal insufficiency? In general, it's ju it's still a rare disease. It's just like Marfan's. It's about 0.01% of the population. So you'll you'll run into one patient, at least in your career, with this condition if you have a long uh, career as a primary health care provider. The general prevalence has also been on the increase, and that's pretty easy. Why? It's because the baby more baby boomers around. We have a much older percentage of our population is old and they have all kinds of uh, chronic inflammatory diseases and arthritis and they need anti-inflammatories and they get put on exogenous glucocorticoids like prednisone and then when they try to come off them all kinds of trouble starts so that's most likely the reason for it all right so there's two primary types or flavors, if you will, of adrenal insufficiency. There's primary adrenal insufficiency. That's the, the Addison's disease that you probably know. And then there's secondary adrenal insufficiency. Just a real quick basic note card. You can tell these two apart really quickly. In primary adrenal insufficiency, ACTH is going to be really high because there's nothing wrong with the HP axis. The hypothalamus and pituitary are fine. Secondary adrenal efficiency, patients are going to have very low levels of ACTH because the HP axis is the one that's messed up for whatever reason. So that's a quick, easy, softball question. You can't miss a question like that. All right, primary adrenal insufficiency, that's Addison's disease.
Sometimes it's called primary hypoadrenalism. Prevalence is about 0 0.0, we already said, 0.01%. Um, it's caused by a disease of the adrenal cortex itself. So we'll look at the three A's here. And the usual cause of it is an autoimmune attack. And let's remember the adrenal gland, right? We have a capsule which surrounds it, this brown thing. It doesn't do anything. But then we have the adrenal cortex, which is made of the GFR, uh, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. And then we have the adrenal medulla, uh, typically is not affected by these conditions. All right, um, so with primary adrenal insufficiency, you can get a, a loss of all of the adrenal steroids, cortisol, aldosterone, uh, and the adrenal androgens, or DHEA. Some authors just, just say DHEA. Some authors say androstenedione. Some authors say the adrenal androgens. So, yeah, that's all three. And, yeah, so that's not a good thing. Um, but we'll see the most common cause of primary adrenal insufficiency uh, typically spares the, the zona glomerulosa, as we'll see. Um, so the most common cause is an autoimmune attack, and we'll look at exactly who that is in a second. You can also, the second most common cause is an infection by some bug. Worldwide, it's actually tuberculosis, which is a bug, an infection is the worldwide cause, but in the Western world it's an autoimmune cause because we have TB pretty much under control. So, yep, it's auto, it, Addison's is usually then autoimmune related about 85% of the time in the West or developed nations, that's the cause of it. And, um, yep, sometimes it's called autoimmune adrenal insufficiency. Sometimes it's called autoimmune adrenal itis. So these are all forms of primary adrenal insufficiency. So put that on your note card. You've got to know these things. All right, so Addison's disease. Um, Addison's disease isn't always autoimmune related, though, right? Because there's an infection uh, type or cause as well. Here's a three of Addison's disease. Here's the typical th classic triple A. Addison's disease equals adrenal cortex injury. That's true of both types. Uh, and autoimmune related is the most common cause. Um, you could also say, if you wanted to add a, how about this one, a bug. There's another one, because that is another cause of, um, of Addison's disease as well. It's not the usual, though. So, who is the target of this autoimmune attack? There's a specific target almost 99% or 90% of the time. This is the target. And it is a CYPA, uh, CYP21, or more commonly known as 21-hydroxylase. Um, the 21-hydroxylase gene is attacked. And why all of a sudden it starts to look foreign to the body, we don't understand what the deal is. But all of a sudden the body starts attacking this gene and without, with a dysfunctional 21-hydroxylase, we know from our biochemistry that you can't make, you can't make aldosterone. Is that true? That's true. You can't make aldosterone, and you can't make cortisol. Both of those are needed for this, this type. All right. Did I say, I was just thinking all of a sudden, I think I said that aldosterone is spared in primary. Aldosterone release is not spared. That's in secondary, if I said that. So I think I said that at the beginning, so that's not true. In primary adrenal insufficiency, cortisol and aldosterone are both almost always taken out of the play, so they don't work anymore. Right, so autoimmune adrenal insufficiency, the adrenal androgens are typically spared. Why are they spared? I always ask that question. People get that wrong. They think that the whole adrenal cortex is taken out. Maybe in an infection that's true, uh, but not in an autoimmune attack against CYP21. Remember this? So how do we make the 
adrenal steroids. Well, they all start out as cholesterol. I'm not going to go through this again. We already did this. Uh, but once you get to uh, pregnenolone is converted in progesterone, 21 hydroxylase is important for both of these pathways to make aldosterone and cortisol. So if you knock out 21 hydroxylase here, 21 hydroxylase here, you knock out aldosterone and you knock out cortisol as well. Um, so that's a problem. Right, because the you have you need these for life. You can't live without cortisol, in particular. But there's no there's no um, there is no CYP21 over here, right? CYP17 works just fine. So you can make the androstenedione, and you can make all of the the adrenal androgens just fine. All right, let's see how that works. I get everything there. Yep. Zona reticularis is spared. What about antibody testing? Can we test for this? Well, in kids, we can test with kids if you suspect this. In fact, this is unusual. Very high specificity of 100%. If a child who has the symptoms of Addison's disease, if you test them for antibodies and you find this autoantibody to 21-hydroxylase, or the 21 hydroxylase autoantibody, um, it's 100% uh, sure that the kid has Addison's disease. In adults, it's not so easy. It drops to 50%. So the specificity is not very good. There's a large false positive rate in adults, but in children, it's a very good test. Yep, there's con it's an autoimmune disease. So if you there's the rule: if you have one autoimmune disease, you're going to have another one. So about 50% of Addison's patients have another autoimmune disease. Diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Hypothyroidism, that's Hashimoto's disease. Vitiligo, we'll look at that in 7th quarter, but that's, I think we've talked about that a little bit. That's an autoimmune attack against melanocytes. Very symmetrical, very strange looking disease. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, pernicious anemia, we're all experts on uh, pernicious anemia, right? All right. So now we have non-autoimmune Addison's causes. So even though most of the cause is autoimmune attack, it's not always an autoimmune attack that causes primary. Remember, primary adrenal insufficiency is AK for Addison's disease. Primary means the adrenal gland is not functioning, and the problem is with the adrenal gland. Um, and so these, these causes can knock out the entire adrenal gland, so even the adrenal androgens could be deficient, meaning they're not produced enough uh, in this condition. Right? Um, infection, the cause. So... Uh, infection, tuberculosis, as we said, is a bug. It's an tuberculosis bacteria is a bug. It is the most common cause of Addison's disease worldwide. What's the most common cause of Addison's disease in the West, in the developed countries? We just said it's an autoimmune attack against 21 hydroxylase gene and or enzyme. Right? Um, but infectious... Tuberculosis. It's, it's often called tuberculosis adrenalitis. They're not going to call them boards. They're going to call it, um, it's going to be a non-autoimmune cause of Addison's disease. This is also, you could say, it's a non-autoimmune cause of Addison's disease. Um, yep. Um, some other ones, the, H, the, the AIDS virus, the HIV virus also loves the adrenal gland, so it could inflame the entire adrenal gland and take it out if you get an inflammation. Histoplasmosis, cytomegaly virus can also do this. How about non-infectious causes of adrenal insufficiency, not including autoimmune? Um, so metastatic disease from breast cancer or lung cancer can definitely hit the adrenal cortex and the, the cell growth can mechanically interfere with the production of hormones. Plus, if you have cancer cells in your adrenal gland, you're going to get an inflammation. Your body's going to try to fight them so that you get inflama inflammatory damage. And all of that stuff messes up 
um, the adrenal cortex so it can't produce its hormones. You could get a bleed if you because the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex is a living tissue with living cells. They need blood and oxygen, right? Where does that come from? Well, the, the adrenal artery. So what if you get a leak in the adrenal artery? What's going to happen to the adrenal gland? It's going to start to die, right? It's going to become ischemic. So that's a hemorrhagic cause of Addison's disease. How about if the blood vessel doesn't leak, but what if you get a beaver dam in the blood vessel? Uh, what if you get uh, from atrial fib and you throw a uh, you throw an embolism and it goes down the pipes and ends up in the adrenal artery and clogs it? So that's another cause uh, is an embolism or any other beaver dam. Maybe you have a tumor next to growing next to the adrenal artery and it pushes on the adrenal artery to the point it pinches it. You don't get any blood flow. It's a beaver dam. Um, so these are all non-infectious causes and non-autoimmune causes of adrenal insufficiency. How about the primary adrenal insufficiency blood work? Uh, what would that look like? Now it depends a little bit on uh, whether or not the zona reticularis is affected or not. Uh, remember we said if it's an autoimmune attack, the zona glomerulosa, that's aldosterone, the zona fasciculata, that's cortisol. Those will be deficient. Um, but oftentimes, uh, you're not going to have any problem with the adrenal steroids. So those hormones will be a lot normal. See how that works. Um, so, yeah, here's that blotchy, kind of a side note. Here's this blotchy look in someone with primary adrenal insufficiency. Uh, they have hypopigmentation, and we'll look at that in the next lecture a little more in detail. That doesn't look like Kennedy, does it? Kennedy was more symmetrically tan, which could happen, but it usually doesn't. All right, so usual blood work in someone with primary adrenal insufficiency. They'll have decreased cortisol. They'll have decreased aldosterone, but they'll have normal levels. And there should be a big star. I just redid this slide, but so put a big star here because this is really high yield stuff. I think we're going to review this stuff tomorrow, too. Um, but they'll have normal adrenal androgens. So who are the adrenal androgens? You should know who they are, too. DHEA, DHES, and androstenedione. Or you could say testosterone or estrogen. That's further on down the line. The other big key here is you're going to have really high levels of ACTH. Right? And we've already talked about ACTH, um, how it can get into the dermis of the skin and stimulate melanocytes to make melanin, which over uh, the, the melanocytes over inject the carotenocytes with melanin, uh, and then you get that blotchy look, right? We've talked about that before. So, very high levels of ACTH, not true of secondary adrenal insufficiency, very low levels of ACTH. Got it? All right. Why is there high levels of ACTH? Well, you need cortisol to turn off the machinery that makes CRH and ACTH. Remember that double negative feedback system? I'm not going to go over that again. Or maybe I will in a little while. Um, what are the classic symptoms of someone with Addison's disease? And this varies depending on uh, whether or not it's caused from autoimmune uh, versus infection, but uh, this is a classic uh, Michael study, or that's Michelle, isn't it? Michelle study. I think it's a French Michelle. I don't know. ETL 2014 study where they looked at a large number of patients presenting with Addison's disease. 100 percent of them were anorexic because of GI nausea, abdominal pain from the, you know, if it's a tumor or an inflammation, the adrenal gland has has nerve fiber in it, and you can get visceral pain from it. And you don't want to eat. You get constipation, diarrhea. So all of these GI symptoms are responsible mostly for anorexia, weight loss, and fatigue. Um, hyperpigmentation, like we just saw, right? Where's hyperpigmentation? Right here. Um, that's seen in 94%. The GI symptoms aren't seen in everybody, 92%. And then hypotension, hypovolemia, 
which kind of leads to the fatigue. So, so all, these are kind of clustered together, but those are the most common symptoms in this study of people just being diagnosed with Addison's disease. All right. Um, secondary adrenal insufficiency. Let's take a look at that now. Um, so this time, there's nothing wrong with the adrenal gland other than it's not being driven by adrenal corticotropic hormone or ACTH. So it's a pituitary or hypo and or hypothalamus problem. Whatever the problem is, ACTH is not being produced. And without ACTH, you can't, you can't release cortisol. What about aldosterone? Aldosterone is just fine, right? Aldosterone is regulated by the R2A system, uh, and specifically it's regulated by angiotensin II. Okay, so that's not going to be affected in secondary. So a quick, if you do a blood test and they have low levels of ACTH, it's a secondary adrenal insufficiency problem. If they have super high levels, it's a primary. See how that works. Okay, by far the most common cause of secondary adrenal insufficiency is iatrogenic. Um, it's man-made problem, and it's because they've been taking exogenous corticosteroids like prednisone, hydrocortisone, dexamethasone. People are on these things for life oftentimes because it's so hard to come off them. And um, the, the old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it as it really, really, really uh, goes to the uh, the pathophysiology of the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. Because if you don't use it, it you lose it, and it's really hard to get it back sometimes, as we'll see in the study. Um, so yeah, so somebody gets a flare-up of rheumatoid arthritis, and they need to be on prednisone. And they they end up being out for six months, and now the flare up is over, and they try to come off, and all the machinery is broken. Uh, the help the hypothalamus is kind of dried up in the cells, Paracel the paracellular neurons are all dried up, and they it, it's hard to get them to come back on. Same with the corticotroph cells that secrete POMC ACTH, they get dried up, and it's hard to turn them back on, especially the older that you get. So the prevalence of secondary adrenal insufficiency is actually twice as common as Addison's disease, about 0.2% of the population. And remember this, I should have put this in here, but this is an iatrogenic. It's a, this is a problem for taking, kind of a man-made problem. So why do you take prednisone? Ooh, big stars here. It's because I had room. This is, you got to know this. Uh, because people have inflammatory conditions. Uh, whether they be autoimmune conditions um, or they're just bug-related conditions, they have pain, and prednisone is great at snuffing out pain. We talked. We didn't talk about prednisone. We talked about COX-1 and COX-2. Prednisone snips the inflammatory cascade way up at the top, so it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory. That's why they take prednisone. So respiratory problems, GI problems, musculoskeletal problems, dermatological problems in particular. Uh, and so these are, they're taking prednisone for all sorts of things, but especially musculoskeletal problems like RA. Other forms of exogenous glucocorticoids. So it's not just taking prednisone pills or, or injections. People with really bad asthma, sometimes three or four times a week, they're inhaling cortical steroids so they can breathe. That's another form of steroid use. It's really hard to come off that one, although they're probably not going to come off it anyway because asthma is really not curable. Topical corticoids for dermatological conditions. Intraarticular corticoids, you get steroid shots, epidural steroid shots for back pain. Interarticular cortisone shots for knee pain, ankle pain, wrist pain. Um, ocular corticoids for problems with the eyes. Rectal corticoids for hemorrhoids. Progesterone therapy is another steroid for uh, breast cancer and menopause and things like that. So there are other forms of steroids. How, do long, how does the long-term use of exogenous glucocorticoids cause trouble? Well, I kind of spoiled the party I said already. Um, it's not so much the problem with regard to 
adrenal insufficiency, it's not the problem while you're on them. The problem is when you come off them because you can't get the machinery turned back on. Right? So because of exogenous glucocorticoids, our glucocorticoids like cholesterol, they can also turn off the HP axis, right? Uh, so prednisone is similar enough to cortisol that it can shut off uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So no CRH, no ACTH can be secreted. And just like cortical uh, steroids, yeah, they can bind with specifically parvocellular neurons and cortical troughs and shut them down. So it acts, it invokes the du the negative, the double negative feedback system. And we know who they are already. Oh, here it is. I did put it. It's like the third time we've seen this. But cortisol, we know, binds to parvocellular neurons. It binds to corticotroph cells and knocks them out of action. Uh, without parvocellular neurons functioning, there goes your CRH and your ADHP as well. I could have put that in there. And it also binds to corticotroph cells and knocks them out. Um, so double double whammy, you can't make ACTH. Without ACTH, you can't make cortisol uh, or the adrenal androgens, which is not important. That You don't need those for life. Okay, no, C, no ACTH and no uh, DHEA. You will die, right? You're not going to die. Well, you just said that you need... You just said that ACTH causes the release of cortisol. So if you don't have ACTH, you're not going to have any cortisol, so you're going to die. No, you're not, because you're taking a replacement cortisol. You're taking your prednisone is a cortisol. It can still stimulate uh, the glucocorticoid receptor, so you're not going to die from this. All right? So you can still have plenty of blood sugar around most of the time, um, DHEA is another story. Your your testosterone sex drive may decrease because you're not going to have DHEA. The adrenal androgens aren't going to be around uh, because the cortisol doesn't stimulate those. Those work on uh, their own receptors. So that could be a problem. You could supple take supplemental testosterone if you want. Um, Why do you say sort of takes the place of cortisol? Well, here's the problem. So if you're taking cortisol, you're acting like the HPA axis. But what happens if you get a huge stressor in your life? You fracture your female. A loved one dies. Some major, you get COVID-19 in the emergency room. Huge stressors soak up glucose like crazy. You could slip into hypoglycemic shock without that glucose. Normally, your, pituit, your HPA axis would sense that sucking up of glucose and they would crank out cortisol like crazy, very high levels. Cortisol will do its thing uh, and mobilize blood sugar so you have plenty of blood sugar. We'll look at that exact mechanism coming up pretty soon in a couple lectures. Um, but you don't have a, your HP access is shut off. You're the HP access. So if you don't change your dose, you're going to be in big trouble. You could slip into hypoglycemic shock. So that's the problem with that. So severe, everything I said, so um, severe stress, you can't make additional cortisol to combat the stress. You could slip into hypoglycemic shock and die. What's the solution? Duh, you take more prednisone. You have to, you have to act, you have to act like the HP axis. And it's very difficult to get people who are on, um, people who have diseased HP axis and can't make cortisol and and have to take cortisol themselves, um, it's very difficult to know. Um, and we'll get into that more when we talk about adrenal crisis, but you have to take more of exogenous glucocorticoids like prednisone uh, to combat the stress and, and, gly and, gly and hypoglycemia that can also occur, or that will occur with us as well. And it's difficult to know how much to take. Um, another problem with cortisol, or with uh, exogenous glucocorticoid therapy, prednisone. Um, here's the big one. This is where we are. This is secondary adrenal insufficiency. When you try to come off, your HP axis won't come back, or it comes back really slowly, and it can take a long time. And in some patients, 
even with maybe a month course of glucocorticoids, it never comes back and you're stuck in adrenal insufficiency mode. You have to take, um, you have to become your own HP axis in that case. So yeah, they have to take glucocorticoids forever to manage that. Here's a study, a really good study, pulled up a couple quarters ago in a great journal, uh, Impact 5.2, which is very good, a very trustworthy journal. Um, they It's a systematic review of 73 really high-quality studies. And um, they took all the data, 3,100 patients, more than 3,100 patients, and they looked at the data together to see what they could see. Most of these patients, these 3,000 patients, had been taking glucocor glucocorticoids greater than 12 months before they tried to come off. And look at this number, what happens. 15% of them were not able to turn back their own machinery. And they were still fighting uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency three years after their attempt their first attempt to come off the glucocorticoids. That's a pretty big number. Doesn't happen to everybody. Some people can get off them, but that's a that's a it's really tough to come off these things. Now I'm not talking about your typical run of the mill um, little little five day course of prednisone, which is very common, or even a fourteen day course. Uh, that's pretty rare that that people will slip into secondary adrenal insufficiency. But once you go over 30 days or so, and that number's all over the place, um, you have an increased risk for kind of wrecking your machinery. It won't wake up. Um, evidence for long-term. Is there a way we can tell who somebody's been on glucocorticoids, exogenous glucocorticoids for a long time? Yeah, uh, we can histologically look uh, at the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, or the adrenal gland. And atrophy, the tissue will atrophy. You can see the cells dried up within 30 days sometimes. So it can happen really, really quickly. That's why I like that 30-day uh, kind of mark. Um, yeah, so and you have ac hypothalamic atrophy, anterior pituitary, and adrenal cortex atrophy. So, bottom line, if you remember one thing to take with you for the rest of your career, when your patients are, your M their primary docs are prescribing glucocorticoids, they have to be careful. You can't just stop taking them cold turkey. You have to wean yourself off. You take slow, lower and lower doses to wean yourself off. That'll give your HPA axis time to wake up and come back to life so it can take over. And just hope that you don't have some big, huge stress event while you're weaning off. Yeah, what happens if you've been on glucocorticoids for six months and you just go, ah, okay, I'm coming off them. I don't like meds anymore. I saw some YouTube video. I'm going to use some magic herb instead. And you just stop taking glucocorticoids. You're in big trouble. Uh, your blood sugar will crash. You'll go into hypoglycemic shock. Um, and, yeah, because your machinery's off. You can't make, you can't make cortisol, and you need cortisol to stay alive. All right. Cortisol is super important at mobilizing sugar. We'll look at that. You already know that from biochem. Yeah, that's why you always taper off anything. More than a four to five day course, there should be a taper with it. If you go on a 14 day course, you better taper. Um, there are some rare causes besides kind of iatrogenic man-made causes. There are some rare causes of secondary adrenal insufficiency. So we can get mutations. You're born with these mutations of the POMC gene, which makes a C, which makes ACTH. Um, you could get uh, specifically if you want to really go into the weeds. Um, there is a, a POMC gene. Yeah, you could get a mutation of that. There's a SOC3 gene that's important. I think that's for PC1. And there's a Prop1 gene mutation um, that. Uh, could occur. These are all super rare. I would never ask you that. That's super rare. I don't even think boards. That's maybe the POM. If I asked you anything, the POMC gene, you should know that one. But these other ones, you don't need to know. But yeah, dysfunction of those genes, you can't make ACTH, and there you go. No ACTH is secondary hypoadrenalism.
um, you could have a tumor. So if you have a adrenal adenoma, so Cushing's patients typically talk, have we talked about Cushing's? I can't remember. Um, but they t they typically have tumors in their adrenal gland, and if you take those out, you can wreck the adrenal cortex, and that can cause a secondary um, hyperadrenalism as well. Is that right, though? Because that would be a problem with the adrenal gland. I never caught that before. I was thinking that the pituitary tumors uh, for sure can do that. Prolactinomas, tumors in the pituitary, but this adrenal adenoma. Yeah, I don't think that's right, Williams. Williams had that in there. 41. Yeah, I'm going to take that out. I don't think that's correct because that would have the same effect as adrenal adenoma so you couldn't you couldn't make cortisol and then you're yeah this would be a primary cause that's not a secondary cause I just caught that um, yeah but but other secondary hyper or hypoadrenalism causes for sure are tumors within the anterior pituitary uh, that crush the machinery to make ACTH like a prolactinoma um, or a any any type of tumor in the pituitary. Prolactinoma is the most common pituitary tumor. Um, and so you go in there and try to take that out, uh, you may damage the pituitary to the point it doesn't make ACTH. Um, pituitary metastatic disease, if you get cancer in your pituitary gland, um, then you have a secondary, you can't make ACTH. So the cancer could go into the adrenal gland and you could have a primary adrenal insufficiency because it takes out and you can't make cortisol. Um, you could also have a CNS or nasopharyngeal infection that invades the hypothalamus and or the pituitary gland and, uh, and takes out the ACTH making equipment there. Head trauma that damages or you get a bleed into the pituitary gland and it takes out the anterior pituitary. You're going to have other hormones gone with that one as well. Rare diseases, sarcoidosis, histocytosis, you can't do either. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next lecture. I might even put these together, but we'll see. Hi guys, let's do part two of this adrenal insufficiency lecture. We'll talk about adrenal crisis today. It is spring 2021. It's week five. It's Tuesday. Here we go. So where have we been? We talked about yesterday, or in the last lecture, about primary adrenal insufficiency, aka Addison's disease. And that is usually caused by an autoimmune attack against the 21-hydroxylase enzyme. Most common, that's the most common cause of Addison's disease in the Western world, the developed part of the world. Um, in third world countries, it's actually tuberculosis that is the most common cause of Addison's disease. Um, and they can be a little different because autoimmune attack against 21-hydroxylase knocks out aldosterone and knocks out cortisol. Uh, but if you have an infection, it can knock out the entire adrenal cortex, so aldosterone, cortisol, and DHEA as well. Um, the clinical kind of picture of primary adrenal insufficiency are increased levels of ACTH. I'm going to keep saying that over and over until that gets into your brains. Um, therefore, you can have a bronchy, a blotch, blotchy bronzing of the skin. Uh, you'll have decreased levels of aldosterone for both of these causes, the infection and the autoimmune attack. And you'll have increased you have increased serum levels of renin. I think I forgot to say that yesterday. But if you have hypotension, if, if aldosterone is low, you're going to have hypotension. That'll turn on the R2A system, so you'll have elevated levels of renin trying to correct that hypotension. And again, DHEA, and that's of course the uh, adrenal androgens, may or may not be decreased. It depends if you have the autoimmune version in which they won't be, if you have the infection version, it, 
or metastatic disease, they probably will be decreased. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is usually a man-made problem. It's the most common cause of it. Somebody's been on glucocorticoid stero steroids for at probably over two weeks, um, more regularly over a couple months, and they try to come off, and maybe they don't taper like they're supposed to, and some little stress event occurs, and down they go uh, from low blood pressure and hypoglycemia. Um, so that's the number one cause of it. Um, you can also have other things interfering with the secretion of ACTH, like mutations in the corticotroph cells or the parvocellular neurons. Maybe there's mutations in there, so you can't make CRH. So we talked about those. And yeah, these you'll always have decreased adrenal androgens and secondary adrenal insufficiency. But remember, the key thing is your aldosterone levels will be fine because ACTH doesn't stimulate the zona glomerulosa. Uh, that's angiotensin 2 does that, so angiotensin 2 levels will be normal. How do you make the diagnosis? What's the story with this adrenal insufficiency? It can be actually challenging at first uh, because the symptoms uh, the primary and secondary can be vague, both of them, and they can over, sometimes it's really hard to tell without doing blood work, the difference between primary and secondary. Primary, of course, is more serious because aldosterone is out. Secondary aldosterone is okay, so it's usually not adrenal. That's why it's called Addisonian crisis, because it's usually from Addison's disease. But symptoms are vague. Now, if there's hyperpigmentation of the skin, there's a blotchy, the patient has a blotchy face, then you know it's a that's the primary adrenal insufficiency. In general, the clinical findings start out, they just don't feel well. They, have, they, don't, they feel ill, uh, and it starts out of the blue, usually after some major stressor occurs, though, um, and they don't feel good from that. They think, oh, is this depression, or what, uh, what is this? Uh, but and this may be the first time they realize that they have Addison's disease. Major stressor occurs and they go down with hypoglycemia and or hypovolemia and they end up in the, the ER. That's called the Addisonian crisis and off they go to the ER. Okay, so Addisonian crisis, adrenal crisis is a much better word because secondary adrenal insufficiency is not Addison's disease and that can also cause this. So I really prefer adrenal crisis or acute adrenal insufficiency, but Addisonian crisis is common. Uh, it's an endocrinological emergency. It can be fatal. It carries a very high mortality rate if it gets that bad where you're passed out and they take you into the hospital. Um, you die of hypovolemia usually and or hypoglycemia. Uh, in a nutshell, what is it though? Well, it's a drop in blood pressure and a drop uh, in blood sugar. So you get hypovolemia or hypo or hypotension, if you will, either one, because hypovolemia causes hypotension, and then hypoglycemic shock, especially in children. What causes it? Any major stressor will, is, sets it off. Remember we said that stress gobbles up glucose and it gobbles up water, increases the heart rate, and just increases the metabolism of the body, and that's got to be replaced. Where are you going to get the sugar from if you're not eating? Uh, well, Cortisol is released and it breaks down sugar from muscles and fat, and we'll talk about that. But what if you don't have cortisol to make? And that's where the trouble comes in. Um, how does decreased cortisol and decreased aldosterone cause hypovolemic shock? Well, that's easy. Decreased aldosterone, you can't reabsorb salt and water. And for that matter, you can't kick out hydrogen ion and potassium. But the blood pressure is just the question right now, or hypovolemia, so it's aldosterone. This one you may not know. How can decreased cortisol, we know that can cause hypoglycemia, how can that contribute to the hypovolemia? Uh, decreased cortisol makes norepinephrine receptors on the tunica media smooth muscle cells less responsive to norepinephrine. Remember we said that if you want to raise your blood pressure, you can send sympathetic impulses into the arterioles uh, 
into the tunica adventitia, and that releases norepinephrine, which quickly diffuses into the tunica media and causes them to vasoconstrict, which constricts the diameter of the arterioles, and that's immediately going to blue, uh, bolster the blood pressure. Um, and But without cortisol, you actually need cortisol to make those norepinephrine receptors on tunica media smooth muscle receptive to the norepinephrine. And without cortisol, it doesn't bind to norepinephrine, and therefore you don't get that vasoconstriction like you're supposed to, and that vessels stay popped open, and that that's high blood pressure if you don't if you can't constrict your arterioles. Hypoglycemia is easy. Cortisol, hypoglycemic shock is easy. Cortisol is very important for breaking down muscle and fat, muscle into amino acids. It, uh, fat's broken down into fatty fatty acids and glycerol. We can use the glycerol and amino acids to put through gluconeogenesis pathway. Uh, and that can be converted into sugar, and we're going to get into that one. I don't do a lot of biochemistry, but I do like that pathway. You should know that. And, yeah, and we said stress burns up water and sugar like crazy, so you have to have cortisol around to fix that problem. Um, the stress also increases the heart rate and respiration, which burns sugar and water. We already said that. Uh, let's see. Normally, stress also drives the release of cortisone. We talked about that, right? This stress increases the secretion of ADHP from parvocellular neurons, and that has a similar effect on corticotroph cells. Um, similar effect as CRH, and ADHP drives the extra secretion of uh, stress-induced extra secretion of ACTH. Uh, what are the major stressors uh, that could happen? I think we've talked about this. Infection. Uh, some say this is the most common stressor. You get a some type of septicemia starting or bacteremia or osteomyelitis or a big area uh, of, oh, what else could it be? SARS-CoV-2, tuberculosis, any infection, it's a major stress on the body. Trauma, surgery, burns, myocardial infarction. Uh, small bowel infarct or small bowel block, so some major GI illness. Physical stress, psychological stress, big ones can all cause cortisol to, you need cortisol to offset those conditions. But again, uh, another, f another very common cause of this adrenal crisis or so-called Addisonian crisis is the failure to taper when you've been on a course at six-week course of prednisone and you're, you're, you're said that you have to taper for two more weeks and you just get tired of tapering and you don't taper. And then a stressor appears in your life at the same time and you need cortisol to, to combat that stressor and you can't handle it. And there goes your blood pressure and there goes your blood sugar and you hopefully you'll make it to the hospital and hopefully you won't die from that. I mean sometimes just an overnight fast can be enough to set this off. So. There's a note again, my pet peeve. This really shouldn't be called Addisonian crisis because in this scenario, this is secondary adrenal insufficiency, not primary adrenal insufficiency. Remember, primary adrenal insufficiency is an AK for Addison's disease. Um, yeah, very tricky to diagnose, uh, especially at first. They present kind of weird symptoms, don't feel good, low blood pressure, low sugar. Once you get some blood work going, you should be able to, to figure it out, though. What are the initial symptoms? So we've done this in the last lecture. Maybe added a couple more to it, but um, this is a different, this is Rathbun's um, publication on Addisonian disease. It's very similar to uh, Michael's or Michelle's uh, findings as well, which is, when was that, 2016 paper that came out, a big meta-analysis. So all of these patients, they don't feel good. They have fatigue, tiredness, weakness, 100% of them. And I'm not just saying, you know, I'm tired right now because we just ate. Went to San Juan Batista, had a wonderful, wonderful meal, and I'm tired. And I had ice cream, and I got that, you know what I mean. That's not tiredness. Tiredness is you just can't, you sleep until noon, and you just can't, you just don't have any energy. Uh, muscle, joint aches and pains can be there. Anorexia. Weight loss is in 100% of people. GI symptoms are 92% of people. Nausea, 
maybe not complete vomiting, but nausea, uh, dyspepsia, stomach's upset, your abdominal pain, diarrhea, uh, back pain. They may come in your office for back pain, lower chest pain, dizziness, syncope, uh, some fever going on, craving salt and water because you're dehydrated, uh, and polyuria because your aldosterone's gone and you can't reabsorb water out of the filtrate. The key symptoms, though, if you see this blotchy hyperpigmentation or these lines, uh, see the the really dark lines here? That's classic of Addison's disease. So this blotchy hyperpigmentation's in 94%. Did we say that over here? We didn't see that over here. Uh, but yeah, it's 94% of patients caused by high ACTH levels. We'll talk about it at the very end one more time. I like to repeat things to get it into your brains. Um, yeah, it's converted. Remember, the ex excess ACTH can soak into the skin and be acted on uh, by the enzyme alpha MSH. Um, or, I'm sorry, the ACTH is converted to alpha MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, by PC2, the enzyme PC2. And uh, alpha MSH stimulates the little octopuses, the little melanocytes, to w go crazy and inject nearby keratinocytes with way too much dark melanin. And that gives them pigmentation and it makes them a blotchy type skin. Um, some more advanced and dangerous symptoms of Addison's disease. They'll probably be in the hospital by this point. Um, obtundation is their, you know that word, obtundation? Now, they're mentally out of it. They're just out of it. So they're confused. They don't know who the president is. They don't know what day it is or maybe what year it is. So they're, that's from that's from low blood sugar, most likely. Uh, they'll be in a hypovolemic shock from hypotension. Might have hypoglycemic shock as well. Um, how does secondary adrenal insufficiency cause hypovolemic shock? Um, well, cortisol. So we talked about decreased cortisol uh, will decrease the epinephrine receptor sensitivity and you can't vasoconstrict your arterioles and it, it leaves them wide open so that's going to drop blood pressure and hypotension. Um, ACTH also binds a little bit to glomerulosa cells. So you'll have a tiny drop in aldosterone, but it's really not thought that's much. It might contribute a little bit to the hypotension, but it's, uh, the main thing is the uh, the norepinephrine, the decrease in norepinephrine receptor sensitivity is the problem. All right, how do they look in the emergency room? Some comes comes in the emergency room with Addisonian crisis. Um, well, they'll be out of it. They'll, they'll have aptitation. They won't be able to give a history. They don't know who the president is. They're just completely out of it. Um, a family member hopefully is there, so you need to get some history, some really important clues that this is an uh, Addisonian crisis. Um, they've, uh, well, they have a history or a family member um, has a history of adrenal insufficiency because this is hereditary. Um, they just were, were on a six-month course of prednisone for some condition. That's a clue and they stopped. Maybe even they're tapering as proper. Um, it's really hard to come off as we said last lecture. It's really hard to come off long-term glucocorticoids. What was it? 20 percent? 15, 20 percent of people can't. Um, a history of other autoimmune diseases. Maybe they have hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's disease, or type 1 diabetes. More clues that this is, uh, they have Addison's disease. Um, how do they look like? What do they look like in the in the ER? Really low blood pressure. Uh, they're going to have tachycardia, tachypnea, trying to make up for the hypoperfusion of the body because of the low pressure. Um, they perhaps will have hypoglycemia as well. Um, because they're not getting good perfusion, they may look pyloric, uh, white little white looking, or even cyanotic, a little blue looking, looking of the gums. Uh, because of the lack of oxygen. Uh, they'll be nauseated. They'll have maybe vomiting. They might have fever. Just those weird, weird symptoms. 
right? 100% of them have those symptoms. What do you do for them? What do you do in the emergency room? For many of you guys aren't going to be, you know, emergency room nurses, but you should know a little bit about what's how this is treated. So, well, if they have hypotension, you need to get the fluid back. You need to increase the blood fluid so you can, um, they, uh, you'll give them uh, fluid replacements. And to, to the, you need to, f they don't have cortisol, so you need to fix that immediately. So you'll give them a glucocorticoid replacement. So the mainstay of treatment is fluid replacements to fight the hypotension, glucocorticoid replacement therapy to fight the hypoglycemia. And that's the mainstay. Specifically, about 2 to 3 liters of 5% dextrose. That's a, uh, we'll take care of that. will put some sugar in their blood and normal saline to bolster the blood volume and increase the pressure. Um, you can also give them 100 milligrams a shot or into their IV of hydrocortisone. You can use dexamethasone, so hydrocortisone is classic. Um, and that will give them that, uh, that can bind to uh, glucocorticoid receptors and s have a similar effect to cortisol. Um, you might need to give them some vasopressin, some vasopressors as well uh, to help them, the kidneys start reabsorbing water. So you can start, that's another way to help bolster the blood volume. Uh, in the emergency room, um, the hypovolemia induced hypovolemic shock. So the hypovolemia can, can be very difficult to treat sometimes. Uh, and it doesn't often respond well to fluids. That's why you have to use all these different approaches sometimes to get their pressure up. You order some blood work. If they have primary adrenal insufficiency, again, they're going to be in low levels of cortisol and aldosterone because those, uh, especially this most common, if it's an autoimmune attack against 21-hydroxylase, you can't make cortisol or, or aldosterone if you don't have 21-hydroxylase. Uh, they'll have the key is very, very high levels of ACTH and CRH if you test for that as well. If you don't, um, well, yeah, you could test for both of those. Um, they're going to have high levels of renin uh, as well because of the low blood pressure. So renin is going to be released from the kidney. Uh, their DHEA or endostenedione or whatever you want to call that is also going to be low if it's secondary adrenal insufficiency, if it's primary adrenal insufficiency from tuberculosis, it's going to be low. But if they have the most common type of primary adrenal insufficiency, uh, which is that autoimmune attack on 21-hydroxylase, their DHE levels will be normal. Okay, what else? I didn't. We said that last lecture. Here's some extra stuff, though. Um, hypernate, uh, hyponatremia, because they can't reabsorb salt or water, so 88% of them have a, a have a little bit of of hyponatremia, so they have watery blood, not enough salt in there. Um, this is not seen in secondary adrenal insufficiency, right? In secondary adrenal insufficiency, aldosterone is fine. Hyperkalemia, yeah, they can't kick the sodium or the hydrogen, or they can't kick the potassium or hydrogen ion out into the filtrate. So it'll build up. So 64% have hyperkalemia. Um, and again, that's not seen in, in, in secondary adrenal insufficiency because aldosterone is fine. And also metabolic acidosis, about 70%. It was hard to find a number on that one, but it's fairly common that they also have metabolic acidosis because if they don't have aldosterone, you can't kick, you can't kick potassium or hydrogen ion into the urine, right? But that's not also not seen in secondary adrenal insufficiency. What if they do have secondary adrenal insufficiency? What would that show? Uh, well, cortisol would still be decreased. Remember, second, secondary adrenal insufficiency, they don't have ACTH. So they'll have decreased cortisol. They'll have de decreased adrenal androgens, or DHEA or DHES, whatever you're testing for. Decreased androstenedione. Uh, they'll have normal, here's the key, they'll have normal aldosterone levels. Why? Well, in secondary adrenal insufficiency, um, its ACTH isn't non-existent, and the zona glomerulosa is not affected by ACTH very much. It's affected by uh, renin and angiotensin II, so their aldosterone levels will be normal.
their ACTH levels will be low because remember secondary adrenal insufficiency is a problem with the pituitary gland itself or the hypothalamus can't make ACTH and yeah depending on what the cause maybe their CRH levels will be low as well renin will be normal why well that's that has to do with aldosterone and that mechanism is working fine so what are two clues this is all kind of recap what are two clues for the diagnosis of Addisonian crisis um, well some clues so well do they have concomitant autoimmune disease so we said that's an important history tidbit um, that indicates probably prim primary adrenal insufficiency because primary adrenal insufficiency the number one cause is what an attack on 21 hydroxylase number two have they just come off a course of glucocorticoid therapy well then you're looking at probably secondary adrenal insufficiency um, this this paper said anything greater than five mil and that's 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 a run-of-the-mill dose anything greater than five milligrams of uh, glucocorticoid for more than two weeks is a risk factor for them going into uh, going into secondary adrenal insufficiency how can you make the diagnosis more just kind of confirm the diagnosis from the labs if you're in the ER and the patient is stable you can order something called an acute ACTH stimulation test it's done in the ER and you basically give them a shot of adrenal corticotropic hormone ACTH and see what happens if they're deficient in that um, their zona fasciculata will soak that up like crazy and it'll start making cortisol and they'll feel better really really quick if they don't feel any better after you give them a shot of ACTH then you know they have primary adrenal insufficiency and you could do this even before you get the blood work back just give them a shot of ACTH uh, if if a problem is with the adrenal gland is broken and not making cortisol it doesn't matter how much ACTH you're going to give them it just doesn't it's not receptive to it um, if you take them down to the lab and you really want to look there's something called a corticosin synactin test that can be used and it's another ACTH test that's done in the lab much more controlled levels and such um, and yeah they can make the diagnosis basically it's just giving them a shot of ACTH but it's more controlled and time sensitive and things like that um, you can look for 21 hydroxylase autoantibodies especially if it's a child we said that the you'll see these antibodies in 100 percent of children if this come back comes back positive the diagnosis is made for a child in adults it's only about 50 percent accurate specificity is 50 uh, percent non-emergent treatment so what do you do after they leave the ER they just go back nope their life has changed forever if they get the diagnosis in, in, uh, unless they can you know fix the problem if it's an infection maybe that can be treated um, you know if it's a if the the HP axis is asleep because of long-term cortisol use you have to keep trying tapering keep trying to get it to come back on by yourself but <coughs> excuse me in the time being you have to treat them what do you treat them with uh, well if it's primary adrenal insufficiency you need to replace the cortisol and the aldosterone so who's the replacements cortisol the classic tablet is hydrocortisone simple as that it's by it's a pill you swallow 20 milligrams per day is the normal dose as long as there's no huge stressors going on um, aldosterone needs to be replaced um, the hydrocortisone will stimulate some of the MR receptors for aldosterone but not enough so it needs its own replacement so uh, fludrocortisone is the one that's used and that's powerful stimulator of aldosterone's receptors uh, so those two are what these patients take now the trouble is if you have a stressor what if you get an infection uh, what if you get a fracture you get a may you lost your you know, your best friend or you lost somebody or you um, you got fired from work some huge stressor you got COVID and you're in the hospital, you're in intensive care, major stressors. So a minor stressor usually double the hydrocortisone uh, for two days. So instead of taking 20 a day, take 40 a day. Uh, 
you don't have to worry about the hydrofluidor the uh, fluid cortisone. You don't have to increase that. It's the cortisol you need to increase. Major stressor is anybody's guess. It could be t between 10 to 20 times the normal dose, and this is where you have to be careful because if you don't give enough, you're going to be in the emergency room. And those are usually shots at that point, not pills. What about the DHEAA, especially in patients with secondary adrenal insufficiency or patients who have primary adrenal insufficiency, like an infection that's also affected the zona reticularis? What do you do with them? For men, you don't have to do anything because men have testes that will produce testosterone. It won't be full power testosterone, but it'll be they'll be fine. Women, this is the major source of androgen for women. And so there will be symptoms, and it's controversial whether or not to play. Some women don't have that many symptoms, and some, I mean, it ruins the life of some women. What are the symptoms of androgen defici deficiency? Decreased sex drive and libido, decreased muscle mass and strength, uh, depressed mood, low energy, pubic hair starts to become thin, axillary hair gets thin. All right, um, kind of a recap. What's the biggest difference between primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency? You should know this by now. We went over this like 10 times. Uh, the two big ones are skin hyperpigmentation, right? You don't see that in secondary Addison's disease. That's only in primary Addison's disease. And it doesn't matter what the cause is. It can be, uh, it can be autoimmune primary adrenal insufficiency or it can be infectio infectious primary adrenal insufficiency. Both of those cortisol is not coming out of the adrenal gland and ACTH levels are going to be sky high and they're going to stimulate the alpha MSH which is going to stimulate the melanocytes which are going to make blotchy skin. So that's a that's a key difference right there. Right. Everything is said that happens in 94 percent of people this hyperpigmentation. There's our little melanocyte right there in person with Addison's disease. So high levels of ACTH are being acted on by PC2, converted into alpha MSH, which stimulates these melanocytes to over-inject these carotenocytes. And of course, we know the carotenocytes are ratcheted up. These split by mitosis. Fresh one is made here, fresh basal cell. This is a new carotenocyte. These brand new ones are in the, the stratum spinosum, spiny cells. Right, and they differentiate as they go up, but they're going to be way too dark and way too blotchy. Right, secondary. Uh, yeah, we, I've, I don't have to say this anymore, do I? We've beaten this one to death. Um, the hyperpigmentation is patchy. I've said that as well. Especially, don't forget to look in the mucous membranes. That can be really patchy there. Um, it's also common in sun-exposed areas, in the palm or creases, those creases in, um, on your palm, the axilla, the nipples, the, the gums. There's a patient with Addison's disease. Here's a hand before the disease started, and that was the same color. This is Caucasian, very white, and now she's very dark looking. And after she's treated, uh, this is one year after treating with uh, hydrocortisone, um, back to normal color. Another person with primary or second. If I put this on the test and say, uh, this is a Caucasian, a very fair, red-haired girl, and now she's got this blotchy tan, is this primary adrenal insufficiency or secondary adrenal insufficiency? It's primary, right? Primary makes ACTH levels go very, very high. Same thing. I could put that on the picture. There's blotchy gums in a patient with primary adrenal insufficiency. Palmer creasing again, all that African-American, but they still, because how can you tell if an Afro-American has blotchy? You look at the palms, and you see these palmer creases, and all this darkness is not normal. Whew, okay, important two lectures, so make sure you know this stuff. See you all later. Email me those questions. I've been getting questions. See you later.